Now, like a lot of Canadians, you headed off to New York, to the United States at a certain point. Tell us a bit about your time in New York. Has well, it been the 1950s? I had, when I came back from the war, I had worked at the CBC International Service in Montreal, at the head of which was Peter Raylan, who subsequently went down to New York to become head of the radio division and then the information division uh, for the United Nations. I, meanwhile, had gone off to Vancouver uh, for the CBC to become chief producer out in the West, and I didn't know the West at all and thought I should. And so my new wife and I uh, went out there, and uh, uh, she was pregnant with our first child, and there was no place to live. The housing was so impossible. And um, finally, Ira Dilworth, the head of the thing, said, I don't, I, I don't know what else to do. I don't think there's anything else that, uh, that we can do to f find you housing. And we'd been moving from apartment to apartment, staying with friends and so on, with a child on the way. You know. So I uh, was at the hell with this and uh, uh, paid my way back again to Toronto. And that would be 1950? 55. No, 55. no, 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 1945. 1945. 45, 46. So what took you to New York? I got back to Toronto, and the minute I got back to Toronto, Peter Aylin, who had heard through the grapevine that I had left the CBC, said I wanted to come to New York and do documentaries for the UN. And I had done a lot of documentary work at CBC Radio. Right. And that's what I went down to do, to write them. And uh, all three of the shows that I had done, one on Atomic Energy, uh, one Pulitzer Prizes. That was very exciting. I was working with the biggest stars. All the American stars were volunteering their time for these shows. Uh, Gary Cooper, for instance, whom I had narrating the show on Atomic Energy, but he could not say nuclear to save his life. Nuclear. It, it, it came out nuclear every time. Nuclear. And after it was over, the engineer and I had to sit down with the tape, <laughs> and we had him saying it right once, and we had to splice in that right once for the 92 other times he'd said it wrong. How many years were that you? That was also the, only, the one and only time that uh, Einstein went on television to do that uh, documentary. That, that one was quite a remarkable one. Which documentary? Uh, on atomic energy. That you did? Yeah. I oh, wrote it. So you uh, met him? No. I know. I, no, we had to be a lot subtler than that. <laughs> I sent out our very best um, uh, investigative reporter uh, to go and talk to Einstein and forget to turn his tape recorder off. Aha. Uh -huh. And how long, you the, how long were you at the UN doing But I worked with our advisor on the program, was Oppenheimer. I worked with Oppenheimer a great deal for, on uh, that particular show. And the music was by Louis Applebaum, who was then in New York. Not uh, to digress, but what was Oppenheimer too. like? <laughs> Sorry, this is for <laughs> the <laughs> historical record here. Oppenheimer, Oppenheimer, or the Project Oppenheimer Man. was very short, tweedy, thin, like, like a, a, an Irish leprechaun, a short cut brushed hair, uh, but the, remote, the most remarkable thing was whenever I came in with a script, I would hand him the script and he would read it, and I'm not exaggerating, about like this. He'd go on like this, none about, he'd finish about half of it and put it down and say, no, on page 23, line 124, you've got... I had never come across a mind like this in my life. My God. 